This is Coffee Number Five. I'm your host, Lara Schmoisman. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being back with us today in Coffee Number Five. And you guys know that for me, English didn't come easy. I mean, I'm self taught, and as I did have my first degree in screenwriting, which it told me how to tell a story, how to choose the characters, how to how important were the characters and the beginning, the middle, at the end. When I started marketing, I realized not only I had to learn a new language, also I had to learn how to write in a new language. And on top of that, I had to learn how to write for sales marketing, which is called direct marketing in many um, or direct response marketing. Today, I have invited um, Justin Overman. I hope I did say it right. Welcome, it. Justin. And Justin has over 20 years of experience in the advertising world and writing copy. I mean, he got called such a crazy names. And I have to tell you guys this because <laughs> he was called the, uh, the Copernicus of copywriting the mm-hmm. Aristotle, but you prefer a sim of of mm-hmm. advertising and the Sherlock of strategy. Sure, yeah, oh. I've, been, been told, I've been told that depending on, on on how I'm coming in, I've been told I've been compared to those uh, people, which it's okay. <laughs> it's just okay. <laughs> it's your humble guy. So yeah. I just want to talk about copy. How did your life, uh, how did you end up writing or interested in writing copy? And what skills are different uh, from writing? Because I'm sure that in my, with my background at my time, nobody prepared us to write in the digital world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... So I really had no plan uh, growing up to go into advertising or anything like that. Um, Actually, when I graduated uh, college, I went to grad school for philosophy. um, And from there kind of went into the marketing world, but soon discovered that the stuff that I liked doing was a lot of the creative stuff. And uh, I had a cousin who encouraged me to kind of focus on that. So at one point in my life, I kind of dropped everything and went to ad school to figure out how to be a advertising creative. And the choices, which are still the choices today, I guess, was copywriting or art direction slash graphic design. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people don't know this, but I originally just thought I'd go in for graphic design because I, you know, I, I like, I like that. Um, but then soon learned that I don't, I'm much more of a conceptual person than, than the discipline sort of that's required for actually doing the job of an art director. Oh my, oh my God. You know that I am very similar. I did one year of advertising and the first year of advertising was basically drawing. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. When they told me you need to draw like this salt container and I need to look like a salt container that is a <laughs> famous brand, I just say, I quit. I, I can <laughs> have maybe the concept of a new salt container, but I just cannot do the drawing. Yeah, no. Uh, and so, I mean, yeah, that so... I still, you know, I, I can I can mock things up well enough. Nothing forever for a finished product and, and whatnot. But um, and I think that the stuff that I learned by taking graphic design classes helped me a lot. Um, you know, especially when I became a creative director. Um, but then I, you know, from there it's like, okay, well, you should be a copywriter. So I was like, okay, I'll be a copywriter. Um, you know, growing up. Uh, I didn't do that so well in English classes. Uh, I think a lot of my English teachers, with the exception of one, would be surprised that I went into advertising, copywriting, um, or, or writing in general. Um, and, um, but you know, you, you started off your your podcast by talking about you know English and how it's not your first language and whatnot. And I get a lot of 
requests or piece, you know, requests for advice on LinkedIn from, you know, people from different countries about copywriting. Um, and I mean, copywriting is a universal language. It doesn't matter what language you're doing it in. Um, obviously, I can't write copy in Spanish or Japanese or anything like that. But the that's the <laughs> the writing part of it. The words and stuff is it's almost like the second part of it. the The main part of copywriting is, which I think a lot of people miss today, is is concepting right is ideas is understanding um people and yeah, what makes I, what makes I, it work what makes them tick what makes them move and think you know so if you don't have that edge if you don't have that knowledge then um you can write all day long and it doesn't matter i call it content with intention you need okay. to know what's your intention to write a copy. Sure. If you know, what are you writing for? Brand awareness. You want to make a sale. What's your intention here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And exactly. that to me is the place to start. Yes, that is, that is the place. That's, that's where you have to start. Um, and so when I, when I started, it was, you know, in the late 2000s, early, you know, 2010s. And that's right around when advertising really started changing. Because before that, you like digital wasn't everything yet, right? Um, mm -hmm. We were still doing, you know, print ads and television commercials and, um, and, and, and whatnot. And the, the writers, you know, knew how to write, um, knew how to write, you know, advertising, knew how to write persuasively. Um, the past 10 years with, with the emphasis on, on short-term results that digital advertising makes so addictive um, really didn't help train copywriters how to, to write effectively. You know, especially what I, what I find odd is that the digital emphasis on fast and immediate results is really no different than the direct response copy and the direct mail copy that's been going on for years, like since the 1920s when, when, you know, this type of reason why copy was invented, you know, the type of advertising that's meant to get an immediate sale, not build a brand awareness and, and whatnot. And I, I, my, my philosophy is you could do both at the same time, but I have, I also understand how to do just brand awareness, and, but, but, Direct response copywriting and direct marketing copywriting um, has a whole wonderful, rich history um, of techniques um, and and creativity. There's a lot of creativity that goes in, in, into this. Even like the long ads, the you know the long print ads that you used to see, um, that really just get ignored. Um, like you would think that, okay, well, if we're going to go full direct response, we're going to take some of that, that knowledge and apply it to, you know, online and whatnot, but that's really not what happened at all. And occasionally, you know, you see these people who are, who are selling copywriting classes, right? Um, and they're generally like how to make your Facebook ads more compelling, how to, how, you know, copy is very important, how to make your website copy. And um, I've read tons of these books, you know, they give them away for free. If you yep. take their hour class, I got um, them all. I spend all the time yeah. and still I didn't learn how to, in any of those classes, how to create that sense of urgency. Well, I mean, urg but urgency is just one part of it. But what a lot of those classes do, a lot of those classes are, are literally just, um, Re reiterating like the sort of past legends of copywriting, whether or not it's, you know, Claude Hopkins and scientific advertising. Uh, I mean, in, in that style, or even some of the great direct male people, um, you know, um, uh, you know, Garfinkel and Kennedy and, and, um, and, and Joseph Sugarman. And I mean, these are people who, you know, did the copywriting for themselves to sell their own product. Um, and you can really learn a lot from those people just studying them and not taking these people's classes. But a lot of them, 
a lot of these people that are that are hawking these classes are really just regurgitating that that information, um, which is fine. Um, you know, you got to learn it somewhere. Um, but it's unfortunate that there the the mentor mentorship in the ad industry today is is really not there um, to offer mentorship in that regard. I was lucky in the sense that that I had that, and and if I couldn't find it, I, I sought it out. Um, and I'm a bit of an auto, you know. I, I'm a self learner. So, um, you know, I've gone back and haven't just read Claude Hopkins scientific advertising, but I went out and found almost every single ad he's made and read all of them. And ones that I've liked, I've copied by hand so that I get that, that feeling, you know, like of how to write that way and whatnot. Um, but I feel like I I hundred percent agree with you, and that's one of the reasons I opened my agency. And we have the uh, the work culture that we have is because I believe in mentorship, and I feel like it's something that it was completely lost in this industry. Mm-hmm. And yes. there's that culture in the agency world that you need to get ahead, and it doesn't matter who is coming after you; it's only what in front of you and how far you can get. And it doesn't matter who is in the way. Got it. Yeah. It, I mean, that's, that's the truth. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the copywriters that uh, when I've been at different agencies or that, that have worked under me, you know, um, they, they really like, they don't care. Like, you know, you sit and, and you talk to them, uh, you know, they, they, they send you copy and then, you know, you sit and you, and you talk to them about, different styles and different techniques. And, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of them think that they know better or they think, you know, that uh, because I'm maybe older, like I'm out of touch. Um, and really, I might not know the certain slang, right? Like when you go and you look at these old ads, they're definitely like old phrases of turn, fra- like turn, turn of phrases and stuff that you wouldn't use today, right? Um, I can't give you any examples, but you know you have to modernize the way you speak in your language. Yeah, you don't, you cannot be but, groovy. But yeah, but but just saying something, um, just saying something in a in a cutting edge way is no guarantee that you know it's gonna to to move people, right, or get them to think in a new way, or or buy a product, or get them to do what you want them to do, um, and so. Um, as much of a fan that I'm as of the narrative and the storytelling, because I do believe that there is a, there is a space for the storytelling in the direct marketing world. But uh, at the same time, I believe that when you're doing certain um, formats, you need to go direct. You cannot go around it. Um, I think... I think that for certain industries, you can, you can always do both. And what I mean by that is you you have to be prepared to compromise. Mm -hmm. So if you have, uh, you know, a product and you're, you're, you're doing nothing but direct marketing and, and, and direct sales. So, so what you're doing is you're creating a whole bunch of ads. Chances are, if you're doing it right, you're looking for a problem and a solution and you're, and you're finding a way to relate that problem and solution. Uh, in an ad. And those are called marketing problems, right? Um, you know, and, or, or marketing ideas. So a direct response company will find multiple marketing ideas and spit them all out and see which ones stick. And, you know, um, and, you know, and I'm assuming here in the best case scenario that they're, they have a good copywriter and a good art director, and it's compelling and you will create sales that way. Um, what you won't do is build a brand, right? Um, especially if you're only doing direct marketing, um, you're probably only on Facebook. I, I haven't heard of many brands that have been created only using like f- Facebook advertising. I'm not saying that it's possible, impossible. Uh, and I'm sure that people listening are like, what about this? What about that? And I'm sure that that's the case. But again, it's very rare. And in that case, what they did was is they, they didn't do that, right? What you want to be able to do is you want to find the balance. You want to be able to, to say, what is one or the most compelling problem solution marketing idea that I can focus on 
and turn that into a big idea on a creative level and, and produce it and produce the creative uh, in, in a way that is compelling you know, beyond even just the direct sales. So you'll, you'll get the direct sales from that, but you'll also start building a brand that people can resonate with, right? And this is called brand response advertising. And to do that also, you have to be prepared to kind of be a little bit media agnostic and think to yourself, what are the other ways of reaching people? Um, and, and, and what are the fun ways that I can reach people? Um, and then, you know, believe it or not, there's all sorts of fun things you can do with direct mail or outdoor or television commercials. You have to, right? Because um, the other problem with direct response and, and only focusing on digital is you're only targeting the people that you're targeting. Yep. Right. Um, and uh, other people are not going to see your ads, which you think you're saving money on. But what you're not doing is you're not broadening the scope of your, your brand because not everybody who sees your ad has to be a buyer of your product. That's how you can also make a brand famous. Absolutely. One of the, one of the big best examples I give is this, this um, scrubs, you know what scrubs are? They're like for hospital scrubs. Yes, of course. It's called, called figs. Okay. Um, I don't know if they intentionally did it, but it's like figs are like kind of like designer scrubs. They look good. You know, <laughs> they're not like the floppy old scrubs. And for a while they did billboard ads here in Los Angeles. And I also noticed in New York. I saw and them. I, and I, was I, yeah. And I fascinating think, to see. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, that's unusual because you would think if you went to a, um, if the, if they went to like a traditional ad agency, oh, we sell scrubs. So, okay, well, a digital ad agency. It's like, okay, well, what the solution is, is we're going to, you know, get models, put them in, and then we're going to create a whole campaign online um, and target, um, you know, people in hospitals. So I would never see the ad because I don't work in a hospital, right? And, and whatnot. Um, and, I, and to be honest, I don't know if they're still, it, you know, what their digital targeting is, because I'm not targeted for them. Um, I'm assuming that they did it at the same time as the billboards, but what the billboards had an effect of doing is getting noticed by me. Now, why is that important? Well, when it's, an, you know, like the next time I met somebody who worked in a hospital, I was like, oh, do you get those figs that I see all the ads for? They're making it a conversation starter. They're make, turning the brand and making it famous. And I bet you that what it ended up doing, doing is when they did that, their cost per acquisition on the digital, on the direct side, probably went way down. Because once they're famous and recognized, when the people that they're targeting online start getting the ads for the figs, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, f fine, I'll give in, I'll get it. You know what I mean? Like, and it probably took less ads and, and, and you know, because, the, because of the brand recognition. So it's a really good example, whether they intended it or not, I'm assuming that they did, of a, of a brand response campaign. You know, uh, I, 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 it happens to all of my, a lot of my clients that they want results immediately immediately. And I'm sure that happens to you. They want a campaign that they're going to go online, digital. And I mean, they don't even want to tweak it many times and say, you cannot do the same campaign on Facebook that on Instagram or in YouTube. There are different uh, target audiences. There are different mediums. You need to treat them as different and use a native language. But many times it's why we again the content with intention brand awareness is so important sometimes nobody will buy from you if you are buy from me buy from me buy from me you just need first to be there and put your brand in people's face and they get recognition no a hundred percent i mean look there are some companies that don't need that um you know uh I just, I'm wearing reading glasses now, but I, that's just because my eyes are healing, but I recently got LASIK and my, the guy, the doctor who did it is like one of the, the top LASIK surgeons in, in the U S and, um, he, the way I discovered him was by doing simple Google searches. I found him and, and he doesn't, he, he can rely on the direct marketing. He doesn't need 
brand awareness, right? No, like, absolutely so not. Right, right. He needs good SEO. He needs a whole different strategy. So again, it's it's not not for for everyone. He doesn't even really need direct response ads, right? But probably not. The, yeah, the he, he needs more like an SEO campaign, local SEO uh, reviews, and all. Yeah, he things. needs he needs more 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 of that. So. And, and again, this is an important point. There is no one cut solution for everything, right? Everything needs to be treated in it, in it, in its own way. But in terms of, you know, you know, the, the copywriting aspect of it being, I think that whether or not you're doing brand awareness advertising or obviously direct response advertising, but, you know, David Ogilvy kind of said it best where he said that he felt that, Anybody doing any type of advertising should always start their career in direct mail. Um, and, you know, you might want to update that and say anyone doing any type of advertising should start their career in, you know, doing digital ads, right, or email, right, uh, instead of direct mail. But I'd still go back and say, no, I think maybe you should do direct mail, Um because that's the hardest thing in the world. You are mailing somebody junk, junk mail. How do you get them to open it, read it, and buy it through the post office, right? I mean, that's the hardest thing in the world. And the direct mail people, um, they, they've test, they test everything. I remember I talked to a direct mail person once, and they told me that just for fun, they took all the punctuation out of like a thousand, you know, how uh, funny is that letters um, and mailed it just to see that if it, if it, if it affected the results in any way, you know, I mean, they, that, that they, they know what works and what doesn't in terms of like human behavior and buying behavior, probably better. And so when you spend a little bit of time in direct mail, which I eventually did, at, you know, at certain points, I wouldn't say as much as maybe Ogilvy wanted me to, but you really begin to understand human psychology a little bit, right? Um, and, and you really begin to say like what works and what doesn't work, not necessarily to establish rules, but if you take that same type of rigor in your copywriting and apply that to when you're writing brand awareness campaigns, you'll have a 10 times better brand awareness campaign than, than you think. You have one that actually increases, that might actually increase immediate sales. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm just kind of sick and tired of the war between the two and saying that it's the brand awareness and direct marketing. Um, now the new thing is that everything needs to be entertainment and showmanship and you have to, you have to make the, you know, your brand famous. I, all of these things are true. You know, all, all of them are, you need, you know, like if you look at the best ads ever, they do all of these things in one way or another. They may emphasize, they might have an emphasis on one way of doing it and a more, bigger emphasis on another, but at the end of the day, they, they encompass all of these things. And that's- uh, Absolutely. It's all about the right message and also it's about the right timing. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I always mention this, that uh, there is this very short TED talk. It's like three minutes TED talk. And it's why some companies fail and how, why others succeed. And the analysis shows that the only difference, they all they did the right thing, but the time was not right. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge difference. I mean, it depends on the day that you launch it, you have, that nothing else happened that day in the news. How many uh, movies failed just because of the day that they were, they were launched? Right, and they, they end up becoming cult classics, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's a hundred percent true. Um, at, at also at the end of the day, you know, if it doesn't matter how good your copy is, if it's targeted wrong, if it's at the wrong time, if it, absolutely there's, there's a billion and, other factors that go into play. And um, it's a, a teamwork. You need to be using the right platforms. You need to get the right targeting. You have to have even if you put a real word, put it in the right place. Right, hundred percent. All right, Justin, before I let you go, I have one more question for you. Uh -huh. What are the most three important things for a copywriter to do or to know? Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, that's a difficult question. I mean, I'm okay. Cause I just said, you know, there is no one solution to. And if uh, you want to be a copywriter, what are the three things that you need to, to do or not? Uh, if you want to become a copywriter. So my first piece of advice is to don't do it. And don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's tedious. You're not. Yeah. No. Um, you should, um, always be exploring things that you normally wouldn't want to explore. You need to be very active. You need to go to the bookstore uh, and read magazines that you normally wouldn't read. You need to constantly be on the periphery for uh, new ideas and um, collecting information and inspiration from all over the place. You can't do that if you're locked in a silo um, of, of your own likes and desires, because if you do that, it will come across in your copy. I can always tell it's a weird thing. Uh, I can look at a, like a bunch of people's books, right? Portfolios. And I can almost pinpoint with accuracy, which one of these people is like an egotistical bastard and which one is not right. Uh, you know, I, I could tell, like, you know, you could tell a lot of personality, like this person has no other interest other than whatever. They, they're only, they only approach things from one angle. And then you could tell the people who kind of are naturally are inquisitive and, and whatnot. Um, and because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're going to be taking all the information about the product and all the information from your life and bringing them together in order to try to sell it. Right. That's, and that's just amazing. Look, what you, I think what you just told is incredible. And it's it's so important to be open minded as a copywriter and not don't, don't be that guy that you can say it's I, I know it's you, the one who's writing. You should be able to be like an actor and, and to I, be yeah. the brand. And and this, you know, a lot of people are not going to want to hear this, but it means in terms of everything. It means in terms of your interests. It means in terms of your life experience. It means in terms of what movies you like. It, you gotta, you you have to. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to like the movie, but you have to have been able to have seen it and and put that into the database in your head. Um, and the reason why I said a lot of people are not going to like this, but it also means your politics, right? You got to remember that um, at least in, in the United States, it's a 50-50 split right now whether you agree with that or not. And you're not just selling soap to liberals and you're not just selling guns to, uh, well, maybe you're only selling guns to conservatives. You're not just selling soap to liberals and you're not just selling soap, you know, dishwasher detergent to conservatives. You, you are selling to both. Um, and so, you know, you have to, you know, you have to, you have to have an open mind in not necessarily in your politics, but in terms of, you have to be able to think like both and understand both. You know what I mean? Otherwise, you're going to alienate, right? If 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 politics and whatever starts coming out in your copy, or even as a brand, if you start doing that, you you might start alienating fifty percent of your um, uh, of your customer base. And some people might say, "Well, that's a good thing," um, but I don't think that the employees working for the company will agree with that. <laughs> okay, so, so that was your first one. Let's move that, to the second that's one. My, that's my first one. My second one, uh, which is part of the first one, which is always carry around a pen and a notebook. Um, just because you never know when you're going to hear somebody say something that's interesting, you're going to see something written. A, piece of graffiti somewhere, a, a line in a movie that you're watching at a movie theater. You just never know where, when, when inspiration is going to hit you. A copywriter is always working, right? It, oh, even, something you know, can be a trigger your creativity. Something can be a trigger. So always be prepared to write something down. Um, and I, I, I strongly suggest that you make it a pencil and a notebook and not your phone. Um, just because of the immediacy, it takes time. You open up your phone, you go, you have to, you know, just multiple steps before you can write something down. Uh, a text message might come and get distracted and then you forgot it. Right. Always just carry around a pencil and maybe some folded paper or something, you know, a notebook that you can jot things down in. That's, that's, that's my second piece of advice. My third piece of advice is, um, 
to remember that copywriting is not written, it's built. 90% of your copywriting occurs in the editing phase. Um, uh, if you're not editing your copy, something's wrong, or you're like a genius, and there are not many of them. But even the geniuses will tell you, like, will tell you that 90% of copywriting is in the editing phase. And what you should do is you should almost create in the beginning like checklists. So you, you've wrote a piece of copy. It doesn't matter how long or short. You should go through it and look, you know, create certain things to look for. Look, look for long words that you can shorten. Look for long sentences that you can break up. Look for places that are missing hooks. Look for places that are missing rhythms. Look for, you know, um, it, that, that, you know, that, that that's where it is. And th that's where uh, the copywriting really begins to take form. And so you should also plan accordingly for that. It's not all about research, 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 collecting, collecting data, sit down, write, done. Um, it's, you know, research, 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 vomit on a page, rearrange that vomit, <laughs> look at the re like research and points that you said and, and see where you can start adding things where you were vague. Maybe you can get more technical, blah, 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 like that. That's yeah, you just described my process. I, I know that my team hates me when we're sharing the file because they don't know what I started and where I, where I end because it's messy. Well, that's their fault for wanting to get into the process exactly. too, too, too soon. Um, you know, or just show me what you got. Um, at this point in my career, I say, no, I will not. You will not like it. You will not understand it. I don't even understand it. No, well, I don't um, care. Yeah. <laughs> but, when, they, um, when it's ready, I will let you know. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Um, but that, that's the third thing. And, and that's something that a lot of copywriters, um, I have more or less forgotten that, you know, it, it's, it's in the editing when copywriting is when, when it's done, it's, it's not in the, it's not in the, in the writing, the initial writing. Those are my three pieces of advice. The, uh, that, the first, were, the first one being great. the most important. Like, those were great. Thank you so much, Justin, for taking the time and having coffee with us. We, no I problem. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it. It was so good to have you here today. See you next time. Catch you on the flip side. Ciao, ciao.